We start now with part two, spatial perspectives on port cities. Um, we now more focus on how port cities are dealt with in, uh, in the historical perspective. Very important is that we first start to realize, and I already mentioned that in the first lecture, that what about our perspectives? It's very interesting to see, for instance, the publication by François Gipoulou, uh, a French uh, scholar of social sciences, who wrote an, a beautiful book on the Asian Mediterranean. So he's looking for the Mediterranean as a kind of scape, you could say a seascape, an oceanscape, which was based on the work of the uh, notorious French scholar Vernon Brodel. And the historians amongst you probably all know the work of Brodel. And Brodel was very important because he was one of the first looking at the long-term developments in this particular area. So he concentrated on the Mediterranean. But if you look at the Mediterranean as a kind of scape, then there are many parallels in history as well. And François Gipoulou, he said, well, perhaps we can use uh, the Mediterranean as a kind of metaphor in order to compare the European context with, for instance, the Asian context and the context which started in the Middle Ages in the North Sea, for instance, the Hanse uh, cities, who were connected in the North Sea region. And actually he says, well, there is a kind of scape. The relevance of his work is in order to address the issue that we should be careful looking at global history from a European or an American perspective. So if you look at the uh, Asian context, they will have to realize that Asia was already very important global entity before the Industrial Revolution, so before the 1800s. And you could say that perhaps the Asian context, the Asian Mediterranean, has become the most important port city scape, port development area in the 20th century. So, uh, for instance, one of the statements uh, done by Williams from the Georgia, the Pennsylvania State University says, well, if the 19th century is just the British century, the 20th century, the American, that the 21st century will be the Asian century. Which, if you look at the statistics on the production capacities and the development of Asia, is something which is, uh, well, uh, is right. And that means if you look at now the report development that we have to be very careful looking long term perspective, perspective, but not just focusing on the European. So this is one of the major points which are addressed. So the concept of Bordel, the Mediterranean eh, as a maritime space, a trading crossroads and a link between different civilizations. It's a transnational space meaning there are several autonomous cities and urban region. Important that when you look from it uh, from a transnational perspective, you are aware that the national context, which is, has influenced our historiography since the early 19th century, is not the best criterion in order to study these transnational developments. So we have to look at autonomous cities and urban regions. And these cities regions are, well, there's a time frame it, it's always about temporarily uh, uh, in control of flow of goods, commodities, money and people. So um, he comes up with what he calls the matrix of economic superiority superiority, meaning that which economic uh, development, which uh, country, which region actually in time has is superior com compared to the others. And 
this is important because if you look at the importance of certain regions, then we have to come up with the platforms, which you call platforms connectivity, the urban networks, which are serviced by and created within this international maritime global context. So the platforms of connectivity are relevant. Remember in the first lecture I said, well, it's not just about goods and passengers. The importance of these networks is that they are important creating culture, they create idea, ideas, they create innovations. And in that respect, networks matter and make them more relevant and network analysis. Well, this map, for instance, is very helpful in coming up with a discussion about the importance of the different regions. Look at this map. It's a map which is based with not the Atlantic Ocean as the uh, most important oceanscape, but look at the developments uh, in the Indian Ocean. Look at all these connections between these different areas. Africa, India, Australia, the East Indies, for instance. And you look at these, 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 these lines, the dotted line on the map, they all tell you about the importance of the connections. And if we are discussing the role of empire, which is something which will be done by my colleagues of Glasgow, because they are very much strained in the fact that the British Empire but most of these studies, which are originally very much based on the European and you could say an Anglo-Saxon context being with the UK at the world leader, the primacy of the pyramid, on top of the pyramid. But look at these connections and the connections are very important in order to understand the flow of goods but also the developments in these particular area. Um, and this is something which is important when we're going to discuss the cosmopolitan nature of port cities, an element which will be discussed in the lectures on port cities as centers of cosmopolitanism. And Therefore, uh, uh, César Ducruet, and one of the papers on your reading list is, uh, is, is written by him. Oh, he's one of the authors. And they said, well, are, what are the differences between European and Asian ports? So he actually he's looking at the different spatial, uh, spatial contextualities of these ports, and he's actually comparing them. So he says the first thing he addresses is that the, in Europe, the main markets are located in the heartlands and particularly since colonizations, ports became dislocated from the cities, the port city separation. Just remember, we addressed that in the first lecture. Um, the European ports, there's always a very strong intermodal activities. So the connections between railroad river developed. Inland city versus uh, the inland city generate more added value, but what are the consequences for the port cities? Diversification, cultural and commercial regeneration. The, these aspects which are relevant once we want, are going to discuss the development of creativity. Because where is the added value generated? At the end of the river or more inland? And he makes a difference because he says the Asian system is based on the colonial system and ports are major markets, less developed hinterland connection, which is, of course, the result of the, of the empire. The empire was interested in the outposts because the colonial goods were shipped from the Asian markets, Asian production centers, exporting centers towards the European and the hinterland connection was less developed than, for instance, in the European context. Look, for instance, at the port development of Rotterdam, which is actually a river port, very much depending on the hinterland collections.
So if we look at the competitive way that European ports, according to Ducroet, they are competing in regional single markets. And Asian ports are more concentrated on national markets. But his conclusion was drawn in his early work on the 2000s. Perhaps you can say that now in the international global developments. But this may change in the near future that it is going to change there as well. So the national ports versus the competing markets of the European. That means that the European ports are always in very harsh competition. Look, for instance, at the port cities in the Northwest European uh, economy, Antwerp versus Rotterdam versus Hamburg versus Bremen and so on. So this is an, uh, an example. Um, Rotterdam is a very nice example of the port developments from a city which expanded towards the sea. Look at this major development from a medieval town around 1400. It's developed into an industrial port in the, 19, in the 1870s, 1880s. And then it became the transit port of Europe. It became the most important continental port just after the First World War. And then you see the massive development after the Second World War because of the industrialization of the new waterway. And you can say that from the start of Rotterdam's importance as a transit port in the 1870s, 1880s, Rotterdam became very much dependent on the German hinterland. So this is a very beautiful illustration of how the foreland and the hinterland are connected through the river. And the fact is that if you look at the very small uh, yellow uh, part of the, or orange part of the, in, around the Middle Age, medieval, medieval time, until 1800, you could say port and city were totally integrated at that time. And because of the expansion of the transit port in the end of the 19th century, Rotterdam had developed its region. So actually the port activities stretched it out into the region and the port city relationship, which we became totally redefined because of this development towards the sea. And the most spectacular development is, of course, the development after the Second World War because of the fact that Rotterdam started to develop its industrial port cityscape, almost totally based on the consumption and production of oil. You could say that Rotterdam became the biggest port in the 1960s, the biggest world port. And that was the reason because Rotterdam floated on oil in these particular periods. So scholars of uh, port development are very much interested in these relationships, in particular discussing the spatial consequences of these developments, which are primarily developments based on technology, Remember, the first slide is about the importance of the technology. Technology changes the shape of the port and, of course, the international global market conditions of the, which started in the 19th century. And um, there are several models which are developed. But we come back to these non-models uh, in a minute because they are relevant in order to discuss these transformations. And most Port research is very much embedded into this economic uh, spatial uh, relationship. That's why the uh, geographers are very much interested in these developers, and Ducroet is one. Ducroet is one of them. So, taken from his paper, and when you you already uh, we going your some of your students, some of the students are going to discuss this paper more detail, but look at how these port system uh, research has developed.
and um, they're all kind of connections which make them relevant for students of, uh, uh, of, of globalization and the local responses. So it's, first of all, you can say there is a general theory which is very much based on the close relationship between port cities and urban development. So you can say that port history and urban history work together in a, a, a very closely, but because of these separated developments, different fields of research are developing. And in particular, if you look at these um, network analysis, network urbanization and external externalities, and the research group which focus on global cities and on the international network. We come to that in another paragraph. So this is the most influential model and which is already referred to in the paper by uh, Carola Hein. It's this, you could say, the stages of the development from the primitive port city, eh, the ancient medieval city towards the 19th century. I show that by the example of Rotterdam. The expanding port city, there's always a friction between the urban development and the port development at the end of the 19th and the early 20th century. But you can say even then the Port development is very much um, considered from the urban perspective. So urban development and port development are very much uh, connected to each other. Well, the modern industrial port, Rotterdam is a beautiful example, but not just Rotterdam. Other industrial ports can be mentioned as well. Look, for instance, at the development of the port city of uh, Marseille, Fossumer, is an, another example. And then what you notice is that the industrial development and then it from the 1960s and then it becomes very interesting for students of regeneration, waterfront regeneration, students of gentrification, because then there's the retreat from the waterfront. The waterfront is no longer used as an economic space. So that means that they have to come up with redevelopments. What kind of redevelopments? And these typical brown districts, which you know of literature dealing with the fact that all the port cities are, told need, are in need of redevelopment. And it started with read, read from the waterfront. And the waterfront becomes a new area of development. Interestingly, is this redevelopment of the waterfront? Is this something which is actually done? by port authorities or is it part of an urban development scheme and the urban development scheme is of course interesting because the urban development started with all kind of new activities on the waterfronts which were partly port related for instance in the heritage part uh, maritime museums or etc the london docks the livable docks are examples and perhaps the most important example as an starting with from the continental perspective is of course the development of the waterfront of Barcelona and the Barcelona model became very much influential in, in, the, in the, the decades and you can say that almost all ports in Europe, continental ports, ports like Rotterdam, Haven, uh, Hamburg and uh, Bremen, Brema and Bremerhaven they all look at the example of uh, Barcelona. And then it's the 2000 is another stage that the new renewal of port city linkages uh, because of the fact that if the industrial part is not that important anymore of port city development, but then it's the post industrial uh, part. So you can say that all kind of new activities, some of them maritime related, others not maritime related, become part of new international connectivities. And then we are dealing with the world system of major leading ports, cities, but also the new global cities, which some of them had a very large background, important background in uh, port development. And a very interesting question, which is raised by uh, Hall and Jacobs, which 
articles also on your reading list and they ask the questions why are ports still urban an interesting question because if you just look at the logistics and uh, the uh, possibilities of shaping uh, port terminals in a most efficient economic logistic way you can ask the question why should we develop ports container terminals in the vicinity of the urban uh, areas a beautiful example is compare the ports of Rotterdam with the port of Hamburg something which is addressed in the paper by Carola Hein interestingly that Rotterdam already had a tradition of developing its port economy separated from the urban areas I showed you the map interestingly that the port of Hamburg is an example exception to the general rule because their port developments are very much port activities are still developed in the vicinity of the urban area which from an economic point of view does make that sense in order to accommodate these large container vessels you need to adapt the Elbe well a lot of dredging is being done but look at the environmental the negative external effects which are so great that is still strange you could say from that perspective why does the port authority of Hamburg still wants to develop a port in the urban area and this aspect relates according to Corolla Hein to the maritime mindset of the people of Hamburg Hamburg is an important city the city doesn't need um, that kind of port activity at all but there's still an, an, a nice example why these urban developments and port development take place and how Hall and Jacobs they define a very nice model so I took this slide is an impression of how they work on the model so the ratio well port the port in the urban activities well this is something which they they work together so you can say the urban and the port effects they both have positive influences in each other but when the port starts to develop into a larger port in relationship to the urban then the city government is dealing with all kind of negative external effects so the port authorities are going to respond to that and how the port then develops and this is important it development then depends on the agency relations but also the path dependency in the case of Hamburg and the ancient relations deal of course with the fact that the powerful maritime and port lobby but there are other options so let's look at the other uh, model of, uh, below actually saying well there is still in the uh, the positive effects but then the negative effects are to overcome in order to create a new port which is a port B in this case which is totally distinct from the port A so that means that the urban B and port B so there is going to develop a new uh, port city region so that can be the other effect but still and this is their main argument that the port development and ur development are very much depending um, on each other And Ducret and Lee, they, this is the, 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 uh, the slide which is already in, uh, taken. Uh, um, I took it. Uh, it is already there in your, uh, um, in your uh, handbook, your maritime on, on port cities, your manual is already there uh, about all these different relationships, how coastal towns, etc., developed in the hub port cities. And the blue parts and the orange parts tell you about relationship between ports so in the city port you could say in that case in the middle 
uh, of the model they could say city and ports develop in um, in close harmony but look at the gateway ports for instance Le Havre, Rotterdam, Antwerp, Southampton that means that the port development is more important the urban development um, so this model is used by Ducaret and Lee and they're looking for statistical evidence in order to come up with the um, fact how ports developed in relationship to urban development and they started with making a distinction in in the paper between the level one development port cities and the level two department of extended city regions and um, as shown by this slide so look at the function of the port terminal in relationship to the city and the urban area and this is taken from the paper by uh, Carola Hein and, and the students who are asked in order to discuss this paper. And I took this because to make a separate, she makes separation between the different models. And her argument is that, well, first of all, we're dealing with qualitative data in order to analyze, in order to analyze the relationship between port and cities. And Ducaret and others, they come up with statistical evidence. They have want to look at how these port development, urban development, and demographic development, how they are related in time. And what they come up, they come up with these beautiful pictures, which actually go so an artistic, more or less aesthetic impression of these port developments in time. And the paper of Carola Hein and Yvonne they start coming up with discussing these relationship. So I asked the students and to and the students, it's in the manual. I want them to to present and make a comparison between the two ways of analysis between the uh, towards a comparative spatial analysis of port city regions by Carola Hein and the work of um, um, Ducret and others.